Hey guys, Will here. Welcome back to the channel. Now today's video is one that has been requested over and over and over over the last couple of months. So I'm really excited to be able to finally bring it to you guys. Today we are overclocking our 9900K processor in the Maximus 11 range of motherboards. But it's going to be pretty much exactly the same for any Z390 chipset, including all of the Maximus range. The Z390, if you watch my overclocking video for that with the 8700K, you'll notice that it is very, very similar here for the 9900K as well, with just a couple of little different things that we need to set for the ninth generation CPU. So let's jump into the BIOS quickly now and I will take you through all of the settings. So the first thing we want to do is set our XMP profile for the RAM. Now you can do some manual configuration of your RAM timings and frequency later on if you want to, but I always like to use the XMP profile as my starting point because that is what's tested to be stable with the RAM that you've purchased. So we know that the system should be stable, all other things being equal if we use our XMP profile. The key to overclocking and stability testing is to never change more than one thing at a time when you're trying to fine tune your settings so that you know exactly what it is that's either broken and overclocked or made it stable. If you go and change multiple things at a time, you're shooting in the dark. You've got no idea what's actually fixed the problem and what's stabilized the system. So we'll start off with XMP profile. We can always increase things a little bit later on if we want to. So. B clock frequency, we're going to leave that set to 100. We can change that later on as well, but that also raises the frequency of other components that are connected to the motherboard as well. So generally speaking, we want to start off at 100, work our way up from there. ASUS multi-core enhancement, now we're going to leave this disabled because we don't want to allow the motherboard to use the settings that it thinks it should use. We want to just use the settings that we want to use to manually configure here. SVID behavior, that is the voltage table that is built into every CPU. So every Intel CPU in the current generation and a couple of generations prior as well has what's called an SVID table. And it basically tells the motherboard what voltage it thinks the CPU is going to need for whatever frequency range that you're in. So normally on a CPU, you would have different frequencies that it will adjust to depending on the load and the number of cores that are being engaged. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be locking all of our cores to one set frequency. So we don't need to use SVID for this. We're also going to be setting manual voltage as well. So we're going to leave that set to typical scenario here. So there's a couple of different scenarios that we can select from here if we are using SVID for our overclocking. And as you can see, we've got typical scenario, which should work for most CPUs. We've got best case scenario if you won the silicon lottery and then worst case scenario if you lost the silicon lottery as well. But we're going to leave that set to typical. It's not going to impact our overclocks anyway because we're going to be disabling that a few steps below. Now you would have seen in my previous overclocking videos, I normally like to set my AVX instruction core ratio negative offset to zero because I don't like to pull the CPU frequency down under AVX load. Now I'm going to make an exception here for you guys starting out with the 9900K simply because the 9900K does generate significantly more heat than the 8th generation chips did because of those two additional cores. So what I've found is that for the average cooling that most people are probably going to have here, you're probably going to be limited by what you can do voltage wise, which means you're going to need to bring your AVX load down a little bit. So what this essentially means is that under AVX instructions, so things like benchmarking and you know video rendering and stuff like that, it's going to pull the frequency down just slightly which is going to allow us to remain stable. But the advantage of doing it this way is that when we're not under AVX load, so in scenarios like where we're playing games and stuff, most games don't use AVX instructions at this point in time, we're still able to achieve our maximum overclock of five gigahertz. So we're basically getting the best of both worlds given the thermal limits that we have on this particular system. So if you do have a high-end custom water cooling loop or something like that, you probably can get away with zero offset, but I suggest you start off with one and then work your way up from there. So if you're stable, you can go to zero, test it out, check that your temperatures are okay. So okay being under 95 degrees and then go from there. Now, if you have a lower end cooler or an air cooler, I'd probably set this to two. But for an average all-in-one water cooler like the H100 that I have on this system, negative offset one turned out to be just fine. So we'll continue down. Our core ratio, we're gonna to set to synchronize all cores. So all of our frequencies are locked at the same for each individual core. And then we're gonna start off with a core ratio of 50, so five gigahertz, remembering that it will come down to 4.9 gigahertz with that negative offset of one for AVX instructions. So set that to 50. Again, we can raise this up to 5.1 gigahertz if we want to later on, remembering that we will need to keep an eye on our temperatures and voltages to make sure that we're not running into any trouble there. B clock frequency DRAM frequency ratio, I like to leave set to automatic. DRAM odd ratio mode, we can leave this enabled. 
DRAM frequency, that is set by your XMP profile. So just leave that at 32 megahertz or whatever the XMP profile set there for your particular RAM. This value should match the RAM that you purchased. So if the XMP profile says on the package that it should be 3200 megahertz, then this should say 3200 megahertz as well. So moving down to extreme tweaking. Now I leave this disabled. The only difference I've found it can make is that it can slightly increase your benchmarking scores if you enable it. So it's really up to you. It shouldn't make any difference in terms of stability, but I generally just leave it disabled because it doesn't make any difference in the real world. Anyway, CPU SVID support. So this is what we were talking about before with that voltage table that the CPU uses to communicate with the motherboard what voltage it wants. We're going to set this to disabled because we're going to be using a manual voltage here. DRAM timing controller, if we quickly jump in there, you can see that has also been preset by our XMP profile as well. So the timings there should match the profile of your RAM. External Digi power control. So what we're going to do here is a little bit different to what we did with the 8700K in the Z390 chipset. We're going to set our load line calibration starting at level 7. I found with the 9900K, level 7 gives us the most stable vCore coming on and off loads. Now I will be covering load line calibration in a lot more detail in my overclocking fundamentals course, which will be launching soon. But what we need to understand for now is basically just that load line calibration allows the motherboard VRMs to compensate for the massive fluctuations in current that occur between idle and load on the CPU. So particularly with the 9900K, because it's got those two extra cores for a total of eight cores, there's a massive amount of current that's drawn very quickly when that CPU comes on load. So what happens is the voltage of the motherboard generally will become pulled down as the capacitors discharge. So we need to set the load line calibration at a level that keeps our vCore relatively stable when we transition between load and idle on the CPU. So level seven is what I've found generates the most stable vCore for the 9900K. If you looked at my 8700K video, it was level six for that CPU. So obviously the more load that's being introduced to the motherboard, the higher we need to set our load line calibration to compensate for that. Now, even though we can't measure it with our monitoring software, there is a little bit of voltage overshoot when we transition between idle and load with our load line calibration set this high. But because we're not pushing things to their absolute limit here, and we're still well within the safe voltage limits for the CPU, we're not gonna run into any troubles here. So set this to level seven for now. Again, I'll be covering this in a lot more detail in my overclocking fundamentals course. So jumping down now to our synchronized AC-DC load line with VRM load line, I like to set this to enabled. CPU current capability, set this to the maximum that's available, so 170 in my case. VRM switching frequency, we can leave this set to automatic for this overclock. If we're really pushing things to the limit with things like liquid nitrogen cooling and stuff like that, we can set this to manual. So when we set our VRM switching frequency to manual, you can see we get a new field that pops up. So it lets us choose between a range of 250 kilohertz up to 500 kilohertz. So that is basically the frequency at which the VRM operates. So the higher the frequency, the more quickly the VRM on the motherboard can react to transient load on the CPU. So you might think, why don't you just set this to the maximum then? Well, if we set it to the maximum, we do introduce quite a bit of extra heat to the VRM. So unless you have active cooling on your VRMs, it's usually best to leave this on automatic and you'll find that for overclocking like what we're doing today where we're not really pushing things to the absolute maximum, you're really not going to see a difference here anyway. So just leave this set to automatic for now. If you're really getting into your fine tuning later on, you can set that to manual. VRM spread spectrum, pretty much exactly the same thing. Just leave that set to automatic. CPU power duty control, we're going to leave this set to T probe, which means temperature probe. And what that means is it's going to use the motherboard temperature and the VRM temperature, PCH temperature and things like that to control the power duty cycle. Again, we do have the option of going to extreme here if we need to, but for this kind of overclocking, it's best to just leave it on T probe. All the rest of the settings here, with the exception of DRAM current capability, which will set to 130, can all be left on automatic. There's no need to change these at all. Now, if we look quickly down at our boot voltages, I always leave these set to automatic. Now, the reason for this is that the motherboard can control these perfectly fine for booting up. This only affects up until the point where the motherboard posts, and then it will load your profile and it'll run your overclock settings from there. So if you change these and you get your settings wrong, you can get yourself into a scenario where the motherboard won't even post. So it can be a pain in the ass and it's really not necessary. So leave these all set to automatic. So jumping into internal CPU power management now, I disable speed step because I don't want my CPU frequency going up and down depending on the load. Now this is a bit of a debatable topic and I will cover this in a lot more detail in my overclocking fundamentals course. But basically you've paid for an expensive CPU. You want that CPU to be running at its maximum performance at all times. Now people talk about power efficiency in relation to this as well. And my opinion is you spent $900 on a CPU, depending on whereabouts you are in the world, this CPU is $900 here in Australia. 
in the, the difference in power consumption between having your CPU locked at the maximum versus scaling back performance when it's not being used is, you know, at maximum maybe $10, $20 a year worth of power drain. It's really not much. And the difference in terms of lifespan is absolutely negligible as well. I mean, the CPU might last, you know, eight years instead of 10 or something like that, but who's gonna be using the CPU after eight years anyway? So personally, I really do not see the point in having the CPU performance scaling at all. So I set it to disabled. If you wanna leave it enabled, that's completely up to you. But for the purpose of this video, we're gonna disable it just to keep things nice and simple and stable. You can always change it later on if you want to. Turbo mode, we'll leave enabled. Long duration power limit. So we want to set this to the maximum so the motherboard continues to supply power for long durations under maximum load. So we'll set that to maximum. You can just type in 99999 and it will jump to the maximum. Same deal with our package time window as well. Set that to the maximum and our short duration power limit as well. So set those all to the maximum values. IA, AC and DC load line calibrations. We can leave these set to automatic because they don't come into play when we're using manual voltage. If we're using an adaptive voltage later on, we will need to look at these. But we're not gonna be getting into that in this video. We're gonna be using manual voltage for the same reasons I just described below with speed step. TVB voltage optimizations can also be left set to automatic. You shouldn't ever really need to touch that. Tweak is paradise. You really shouldn't need to touch anything in here. Everything's already set by your XMP profile or managed perfectly fine by the motherboard itself. You're not gonna get more stable overclocks unless you're really operating at the maximum. You're really not gonna see any benefit or any extra stability from touching anything in here unless you're really operating at the high end. We're talking, you know, phase change cooling, liquid nitrogen, exotic cooling, things like that. So for you guys watching this video, I very much doubt you're gonna see any benefit from changing anything there. AI features, now this is an interesting one with the Z390 chipset. If you look down in the bottom right hand side of the screen, now down to AI features. Now we're not gonna touch any of this for the scope of this video, but just to give you a quick explanation of what this is, down in the bottom right hand side of your screen over here, you can see a little section called prediction. What the motherboard does, and this is a really cool feature on the ASUS Z390 chipsets, is the motherboard actually measures the temperature and frequency and voltage as you use the computer day to day. So when you're gaming, when you're doing your stability testing, when you're just using it for web browsing, whatever you're doing, it records a whole bunch of data and you don't even realize it's doing this. It does it all in the background. And what it does is it calculates what it believes are gonna be your maximum stable values based off what's going on there. Now I touched on this in a little bit more detail in my unboxing assembly and overview video. So I'll link that above my head for you right now. You can check that out if you're interested to learn more. But basically, this is something that you can use if you just wanna set and forget and not have to go in and do things manually. So if you're just wanting to overclock out of the box, never touch it again, this is probably a great option for you. So we'll skip over that for now. We're not gonna to touch that in the scope of this video. So moving down to CPU core and cache current limit, we're gonna set that to the maximum as well. So just type in 99999 and you'll see it jump back to 25575. Ring down bin. Now this allows the motherboard to make adjustments to the frequency and cache and things like that. We're gonna leave this set to automatic because it is okay to leave this automatic. The motherboard does do a pretty good job of controlling these things. So moving down to our minimum and maximum CPU cache ratio. So generally you wanna have this set about 500 to 300 megahertz less than your core frequency. So if we have our core ratios locked at 50 or 49 with AVX offset, then we should be able to get away with about 47 or maybe even 48 on our cache. Now there's not a whole lot of performance benefit to increasing this over about the 45 mark. I've seen maybe a 1% increase in performance going from 40 to 45, and then you know very, very, very marginal if anything when we go above that. So generally I recommend leave it at 45. If you've got a little bit of instability, you might wanna start at 42 or 43 and then work your way up. But I think for most people, 45 should be just fine for this. So leave it at 45 for both of these values so it stays locked at 4.5 gigahertz at all times. So moving down to our voltages now, set your bead clock aware adaptive voltage to disabled mode. And then we're gonna set our CPU core and cache voltage to manual mode as well. Now you can see if we go into the menu here, we have the option of auto, manual or offset mode. Now if we enable our SVID support again, so enable that, you'll see when we go back down to our core cache voltage mode again here, we also have the option of adaptive mode. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm not a big fan of using adaptive mode for the reasons I explained before. Now, I know that a lot of people will argue that adaptive voltage increases the lifespan of a CPU and also increases its power efficiency, but I really don't think that this is particularly relevant with desktop CPUs, and I'm gonna to touch on it in a little bit of detail now, but in a lot more detail in my overclocking fundamentals course. So, 
Basically, adaptive frequency and adaptive voltage came from the notebook industry or, net or laptop industry where this was a lot more important. Obviously, you want to save every little bit of power you possibly can to maximize battery life. So, in the context of a desktop computer, it's really not the same thing. And, you know, we're talking tiny little bits of power saving over the course of a year. So, you know, a couple of dollars worth of power over the course of a year. Really not going to make a significant difference to the back pocket. Now, it's also the same in terms of CPU lifespan. I mean, it's, it's not going to make a difference when you consider that most people aren't going to be using a CPU more than four or five years anyway. I mean, I've got CPUs that I've been running in manual voltage mode for 10 years now in old computers, and they're still running exactly the same as they did the day they were brand new. So it really, I don't see it being a significant difference. I mean, you might get, if you're really pushing things to the absolute maximum, you're running, you know, 1.4 volts plus, you might only get eight years instead of 10 years or something like that. But I mean, who's going to be using a 9900K in 2029 anyway? It's just not going to happen. So you really don't need to worry about the impact on lifespan. So the reason why it works this way basically comes down to the fundamentals of electronics. So temperature is induced by current passing through a circuit. Now, the more voltage you have, the more potential you have for current to flow through that circuit. So increasing the voltage allows more current to flow through and therefore we're able to reach higher clock frequencies at higher voltages. And that's basically the reason why you need to increase your voltage when you increase your clock speed, otherwise you get instability. But if you think of voltage like a piece of pipe and current like water flowing through the piece of pipe, you can imagine that if you've got a massive piece of pipe, you're able to push a lot more current through that piece of pipe or a lot more water through the piece of pipe. But when you're talking in the context of a CPU at idle, you've only got a trickle of current going through. It's only running a tiny little bit of power consumption. And that's like having a trickle of water running through a massive pipe. So if you've got your voltage cranked up to say 1.3, but you've only got a little trickle of water going through, it's not going to be creating massive temperatures. And it really makes no difference whether that pipe is big, so high voltage, or the pipe is small, low voltage. As long as that pipe is large enough or the voltage is high enough for that current or the water to flow through freely, then it really makes no difference to your temperatures. And you'll see this when you jump in and start doing your stability testing. You'll see that under idle, when you use adaptive voltage, the temperatures are pretty much exactly the same as they are when you use manual voltage. The reason being that you're only flowing a very, very small amount of current through the CPU so it's not generating temperature to begin with. Therefore running at a fixed voltage really makes no real world difference at all over adaptive. So that is my take on it anyway. Feel free to discuss this in the comments below but for now we're going to leave it set to manual mode. We're also going to go back up and disable CPU VID support here as well. So leave that disabled and then we can continue on down to our actual voltage. So this is going to depend on what you set your frequency to. So in this case, we've got five gigahertz with 4.9 for our AVX offset. Now it also is going to be determined by the amount of cooling that you have. So you're gonna to need to start off at a relatively safe value. I would recommend starting off at 1.3 volts, seeing if you're stable, seeing what your temperatures are like at that voltage, and then increasing it as necessary or decreasing it if you can. So the aim here is to run the minimum voltage for the maximum possible clock frequency whilst maintaining temperatures under about 90 to 95 degrees. As long as your temperatures are in that sort of 80 degree range, you're good to go and you can start pushing a little bit more. So I found with this particular CPU to run 4.9 gigahertz under AVX load, I needed 1.32 volts. And this also just so happened to be right in the sweet spot for my Corsair H100 cooler, which I've got on this machine. So with a better quality cooler or a custom loop or something like that, I'd probably be able to push up to maybe 1.38, 1.34 volts. Remembering that with those extra two cores that we have on the 9900K, it does generate significantly more heat. So you do need to keep things under control. You do need to keep an eye on things. So I'm gonna recommend starting off with 1.3 volts. So obviously, if you find that you're completely stable at that five gigahertz mark, you can lower the voltage until you reach the point where it becomes unstable and then raise it up again by 0.01. So what I would do is I would go down to say 1.29, see if it's stable, 1.28, 1.27 and so forth. And then say I found it became unstable at 1.27 volts, I could then go to say 1.275 volts. So it goes up in 0.005 increments. So you can see here, if I was to try and go 1.321, it jumps to 1.325, but start off at 1.3 and then work your way up or down from there, making sure that you keep an eye on your temperatures, keeping them under that 90 degree range here. 
So moving on to our DRAM voltage now, this is set by your XMP profile. So generally speaking, you're just gonna to wanna to leave this alone. Anything above about 1.4 volts starts to get into dangerous territory. So you wanna make sure it's well under that. 1.35 volts is perfectly fine. But again, it'll be set by your XMP profile. Now, if you are having problems with stability with your system and you've tried everything on the CPU side, you can start to play with the voltage here a little bit. What I would suggest is run a program like MemTest, see if you have memory instability, and then increase your voltage, see if you still have that instability. If you do still have instability, even when you increase your DRAM voltage, it's time to look at your VCC IO voltage and see if that's causing problems. Now VCC IO is the memory controller voltage. Generally speaking, 1.15 volts should be fine for most people. With my 8700K, I was able to run it down at one volt, but with the 9900K, I found that 1.15 volts was where I had perfect stability. You can go up to 1.2 volts, 1.3 volts even is perfectly fine. Wouldn't go any higher than 1.3 volts though, because it's generating extra heat and you're really unlikely to benefit with any extra stability beyond that point anyway. System agent voltage controls various other chips on the motherboard as well, and generally 1.1 volt there should be fine for most people. Again, you might be able to get away with one volt there as well for a little less heat, but anything over about 1.3 volts is the point where you don't wanna go any higher. Everything else from here on, we can just leave automatic, and then we just need to jump across to our advanced tab, go to CPU configuration, Scroll down to our CPU management control. Everything else above here can all stay as it's set from factory. So going down to CPU power management control, we disable speed step here as well. Disable speed shift technology, set our turbo mode to enabled. Disable C states as well, so we don't go into low power or power consumption mode when we're under idle conditions. And then once we're happy with all of that, we can go across to our tool, go down to our user profile, type in a profile name. So we're gonna call this 5.0 gigahertz or GHZ, and then we'll hit save to profile one. Save to profile, and now we've got that profile saved should we need to load it again in the future. So then we go across, exit and save changes. Now you might find that the computer will switch off and then back on again, that's perfectly normal. It's just doing memory training and things like that. And if we're all stable, fingers crossed, it will boot into Windows successfully and we can get started with our stability testing. Okay, so the first hurdle is complete. We've booted successfully into Windows, which is always a good sign. So the first thing I like to do is open up CPU Z, check that our frequency and our voltages are as we set them. So we should see five gigahertz here. We should see it drop down to 4.9 when we're under AVX load, but we're not under any AVX load right now. So we won't see that happen just at the moment. And you can see here, we set 1.32 volts as our V-Core. And you can see here, we've got 1.314 here as our voltage, which is perfectly normal. And what we should see is that when we introduce some load, that will droop very, very, very slightly depending on what our load line calibration is. Because we set it at level seven, we shouldn't see too much V-droop going on. So what I'll do here is I'll quickly run you through a quick stability test just to give you an idea of the things that you need to look for. I do have another very detailed video, which I'll link above my head for you right now, where I go through all the things I do to stability test a CPU and that goes into a lot of detail and explain everything, the reasons why I do things in the order I do, the programs that you need to use and all those sorts of things. But for now what we want to do is just quickly check first of all that our idle temperatures are acceptable which they well and truly are here, 37 to 40 degrees across the various different cores here. You can see here it is switching between 4.9 and 5 gigahertz. I did see it dip down to 4.9 a moment ago which means our AVX offset is definitely working. We can see a nice healthy overclock here of 36%, which is very nice for a 9900K with this cooler. Remembering again that we are definitely temperature limited here with this cooler that I've got on the H100i. If we had a custom loop, we would definitely be able to push things a little bit harder, but that is okay. Now, one other thing that I do just want to mention with OCCT specifically, I found with the Z390 chipsets, the V-Core voltage here is reported low. So I like to monitor it in CPU Z here. Looking in CPU Z, you can see the V-Core is being reported as 1.305-ish, whereas in OCCT it's being reported as 1.18. And that actually threw me originally when I first started playing with a Z390 chipset. I thought, why is my voltage so low? Have I got adaptability programmed in somewhere or something like that? But no, it was just the software's reading incorrectly. But the temperatures are reported accurately, so that is fine. So we'll start up a load here with our OCCT basic default settings. And you can see there's a spike in temperature up to about 85 degrees, that's normal. 
and then we stabilize around the 70 degree marks. So essentially what we want to do from here is run through all of our stability tests, make sure that we're happy with everything and that everything's stable. If we do run into some instability, we're going to want to either decrease our voltage slightly if our temperatures are too high. So if the temperatures are pushing into the 90 degree range, then we want to lower our voltages. We might find that we also need to lower our clock frequencies as well. You might want to start off with an AVX offset a little bit greater. So maybe go to two or three or maybe even four. See if that helps. If it's still not helping, you've still got instability or temperatures that are too high, you're going to need to either look at making sure that your CPU cooler is installed correctly or just making sure that your voltage is within a range that is acceptable for temperatures. So as we can see here with the H100i, I'm within the acceptable range for temperature at 1.32 volts, which is drooping down to 1.3 volts under load. Now we can see here that our temperatures are well within the acceptable range at the moment after three minutes of testing. I do like to leave it for at least an hour though, just to make absolutely sure that our temperatures don't continue to rise over time. Generally speaking, they should stabilize after about 10 minutes or so if you've got a decently cooled system. But looking at CPU Z quickly, we can see that our voltage has drooped down to about 1.3 volts from about 1.31 or 1.32 which is perfectly fine it's good to have a little bit of V droop there as long as the CPU is stable which it seems to be so once our stability test has run for about an hour and our temperatures have all stabilized at their maximums I generally call that pretty stable so what I would do next is jump into a couple of my favorite programs games and things like that video rendering all that kind of stuff make sure that everything works properly in the real world we don't run into any bottlenecks or troubles if everything is fine there as well then we're generally good to move on to our fine tuning. So what I would do next is generally try a AVX offset of zero, see if that's stable. If it is fantastic, we can try to push for 5.1 gigahertz, but chances are at around the sort of 1.3 to 1.32 voltage range, you're probably going to end up with frequencies about the same as what I have here. Bearing in mind that I do have the Corsair H100 cooler on this, which is adequate, but definitely not the best possible cooler to cool a 9900K. With a custom loop, we would definitely be able to push a little bit harder. So we're definitely thermal limited here. But guys, that is how you overclock your 9900K in a ASUS Z390 chipset motherboard. Hopefully you found the video interesting and useful. If you have, please do hit that like button, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell as well so you don't miss my overclocking fundamentals course. I'm really excited about putting that out because I think it's going to dispel a lot of myths and help a lot of people out. But thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.